Father Walter Kajerski is a priest of the Diocese of Rockville Center in New York. And he's a past seminary rector and worked with uh, formation with the uh, deacons and many other ways he's involved with the ecumenical and interreligious interfaith world. Uh, but his main position now, and that's why I reached out to him uh, as a good friend and colleague, uh, he's executive director of the Secretariat for Ecumenical and Interreligious Affairs for the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. And he's constantly on the road with different dialogues with different groups, both ecumenically and interreligiously. So please join me in welcoming Father Walter. Thank you so much, Father Bob. Um, it is a great, great pleasure to be here at the conference that I was wondering if it was going to really happen. <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, I, 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 with great anticipation, was looking forward to being with you last year and the year before, but by the grace of God, it happened. And you know, my, my plane w w was stuck uh, for two extra hours on the runway yesterday. And I said, oh, there are forces that don't want me to be here. But the Lord had his way, and here we are all together. I am so thrilled uh, to be with you to spend some time together. Unfortunately, you're stuck with me for three presentations. But I, I promise, oh, well, thank you very much. You're very kind. <laughs> I promise I'll do the best I can uh, to, to make this engaging and just a blessing to you in your ministries. Um, I'm so thrilled to be here. This beautiful place, uh, Holy Trinity, uh, what a gift. You know, I'm, I'm from New York. Um, and I have to say, we, we don't quite have the vastness of land that, that we see around us here. And I, I just couldn't help it, for those of you who know of the Twilight Zone, uh, today I just took a picture of the cornfield and said, I've been cast into the cornfield. <laughs> <laughs> here we are. But what a great blessing for us to be here. And um, I know that you, just in, in this beautiful space, uh, celebrated the Eucharist together. Uh, that wonderful sacrament the, the, the sacrament par excellence, the sacrament of unity, the sacrament of God's peace, and you entered into, into the greatest prayer we can enter into in, in this side of heaven. But I hope you don't mind. I don't think we can pray enough. We're going to do a little bit more praying as we get together for this presentation. And I'm going to be reading with you prayerfully selection from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, uh, chapter 4. Um, and after we, we pray this scripture, I'm going to isolate a particular verse. And as I isolate this verse, I'm going, I'm going to say it prayerfully uh, three times. And some of you may have entered into this sort of a prayer style before. And as, as I, I, I prayerfully say this, this verse again, three times, I'm going to invite you to really open your hearts to allowing the Word of God to touch you, to transform you, to perhaps motivate you in terms of what it is uh, the Scripture calls you to. So let us now acknowledge that we are in the presence of the Lord. Let us acknowledge Him and turn to Him in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I then, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to live in a manner worthy of the call you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another through love, striving to preserve the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, one body and one spirit, as you were also called to the one hope of your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, he ascended on high and took prisoners captive. He gave gifts to men. What does the ascended meaning mean except that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. 
And he gave some as apostles, others as prophets, others as evangelists, others as pastors and teachers to equip the holy ones for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the extent of the full stature of Christ, so that we may no longer be infants tossed by waves and swept along by every wind of teaching arising from human trickery, from their cunning in the interests of deceitful scheming. Rather, living the truth in love, we should grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ, who from the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament, with the proper functioning of each part, brings about the body's growth and builds itself up in love. Make every effort to preserve the unity which has the spirit for its origin and peace as its binding force. Make every effort to preserve the unity which has the spirit for its origin and peace as its binding force. Make every effort to preserve the unity which has the spirit for its origin and peace as its binding force. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, O Lord, so do many of our brothers and sisters outside of the Catholic Church. We believe this oneness, this unity is so powerful that no human being can totally destroy it. Help us, O Lord, to preserve the unity we do enjoy through one Lord, one faith, one baptism with those outside of the Catholic Church. Help us to be humble enough to admit the ways our predecessors in the Catholic Church contributed to division in the body of Christ, and how we ourselves may have done so. Help us to work to restore full, visible unity among your believers, which is your divine will. We pray that prayer you taught us, the prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ, a prayer we share with many Christians all around the world. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much for taking that extra time to pray with me. And I think it's so important for us to recognize that prayer is never a waste of time. And in fact, it is a crucial part of entering into the ecumenical work of the church. We need to be about prayer first and foremost. Unitatis rent integratio, the document from the Second Vatican Council on ecumenism in its eighth paragraph, says that spiritual ecumenism is the soul of ecumenism. 
And what is spiritual ecumenism? Spiritual ecumenism involves, of course, constant prayer, prayer for the unity of the church, and it is also about transformation, self-transformation, uh, change of heart, a change of heart and holiness of life. It's the soul of the whole ecumenical movement. And so we think about prayer as we start our time together this morning. And an individual that we can consult in terms of prayer and the connection of prayer to dialogue is uh, the 20th century Swiss theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar, who wrote a book on prayer. And in that book, he describes prayer as dialogue. You know, uh, von Balthasar's uh, doctorate was in linguistics, so he definitely was keyed into the power of language. And he, he, he's written that he believes prayer is language. Prayer is, is the language of God. And given it's God's language, it is truly transcendent. It is truly over and above us. You know, Martin Luther wrote about prayer. And he, he, he at times would just be so overwhelmed at the concept that we simple creatures have access to the almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, at all times. I mean, he trembled at that. He trembled at that. The, the, the language we try to express to God in prayer is his language. Hence, really, uh, we're capable, perhaps, of, of entering into some babbling, some, some baby talk. But we need God to help us to learn his language. And so von Balthasar uh, will, will offer some examples. He'll offer the example of the prayer we just said, the Lord's Prayer. Who taught us it? The Lord. The Lord himself gave us that language that we use when we lift our hearts to him in prayer and call him our Father. We think about a prayer like the Hail Mary. How does the Hail Mary begin? It, it begins with the angelic greeting of the angel Gabriel to our Blessed Mother. What are angels? Angels are messengers, right? That's what the word angel literally means. And they never bring their own message. They only bring the message of Almighty God. So those words, Hail Mary, full of grace, are words that come to us directly from heaven, directly from God. And then you have this, the second part, blessed are you among women. That's from Elizabeth, remember? But remember about Elizabeth? She was filled with the Holy Spirit, right? So guess what? That's also God's language. So when we pray, we pray with God's language language. We seek to, to, to learn the transcendent ways of Almighty God and to speak as he speaks. And as we reflect upon this, prayer as dialogue, we recognize that God is the one who starts the dialogue. Uh, von Balthasar talks about it. When did God start the dialogue with humanity, when God said, let us make man in our image and likeness. Right there in Genesis 1, God begins a conversation with us. He literally speaks us into being. And then we know from the first epistle of John, we love God because he first loved us us. God is the one who takes the initiative at all times. And we are called to respond. We are called to, to, to speak in turn at our moment and to enter into a dialogue with the Almighty. But God is the one who takes the initiative. And my brothers and sisters, we know we've been created in the very image and likeness of God. 
we say that, that the church, the church is an icon of the most blessed trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God who has made himself known to us, who has taken the initiative. Hence, if we are a part of the church, if we are living as people created in the image and likeness of God, guess what? It is our responsibility. It is our obligation to take the initiative, to take the first steps, and to enter into dialogue. To enter into dialogue with those around us. And how is the best way to enter into dialogue? We enter into dialogue seeking to speak God's language. And so we need to pray. We need to speak God's language with each other. And with, with those Christians who are not in the Catholic Church, who are also fervent, fervent prayers. Amazing things can happen if we come together and we seek to speak not our own language that can sometimes be all about us, but the language of God. You know, um, there are plenty of cynics in this world. And sometimes people are cynical about the ecumenical work of the church. And they will point out things that are very logical, that are very apparent, that it seems as if there, there are certain lines that have been drawn in the sand on issues, uh, say issues related to, to the ordination of women, say issues related to abortion, uh, say issues related to same-sex marriage. And, 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 and people say, well, why, why are you still bothering? Why, why, why don't you just say that this is the way it is because it doesn't look like these issues will be overcome. It doesn't look like these issues will be overcome. You know, I, I am, I'm now, I've begun my fourth year of full-time work in this ministry. I, I have the unique privilege, and I always consider it a privilege, uh, to be able to devote all of my time, all of my efforts uh, to this work right now. Most of us, uh, and me uh, before four years ago, this was a side thing to do, <laughs> in addition to many other things, like, like, like being a pastor or, or being involved in seminary formation and things like that. But now I, I get to do this work uh, full time. And before, I, I was, of course, involved. I, I've been involved with this work um, since I was ordained, which, which I just celebrated my 20th anniversary. So for 20 years, I've been involved with this work. It feels like just yesterday. And by the way, I, I'm a youngling compared to many, you know. I really am a youngling compared to many. There are so many legends that we have who really dedicated themselves. You're, you're going to be meeting a few and have met a few already uh, during your time here. Um, but you know, if this was all about human efforts alone, I would have given up a long time ago. If I thought this was only about human beings coming together and coming to some sort of consensus or, or agreement, I would say, ah, it's hopeless, let's get out of here. Let's pay attention to other things. But spiritual ecumenism is the soul of the whole ecumenical movement. There is someone else at work here, and that is Almighty God. And what seems insurmountable to us is nothing for God. We believe that. We believe that with all of our hearts. And so uh, entering into this work sometimes calls me, many times calls me to a conversion of heart, to a, a desire to, to allow God to, to more fully take control of my life um, and, and to recognize sometimes we, we give it over to him. And so it's important for us to try our best to learn God's language, to, to couch everything we do in a spirit of prayer. 
So if, if, you, if you're taking notes, um, I, I'd, I'd write in my notes, first thing, spiritual ecumenism is the soul of the whole ecumenical movement. And if you get that right, everything else falls into place. You get that wrong, things can fall apart quickly. So let's talk about what we'll be doing for this, this Ecumenism 101 session today. Um, I know that, that we have listed there um, Orthodox and Protestant communities. I'd like to divide it up into just the general categories of, of East and West. East and West. And we'll start off in this first session with the East. Um, and before we even get into that, though, I'd like to do a little bit on ecumenical method, e ec ecumenical method in general, because it's, it's not, not always a good idea to just walk in to a situation or a dialogue without any type of a plan. So let's, let's reflect a little bit on different methods that have been developed. Uh, then we're going to talk about the Christian East. And we're going to meet uh, some, some churches uh, that perhaps we, we haven't thought too much about or haven't noticed too much. We're going to be talking about the Orthodox. We're going to be talking about the Oriental Orthodox. We also have the Eastern Catholic churches, which are in union uh, with the Bishop of Rome. So after we do, do that, and we will pay a little bit of attention to the Oriental Orthodox, you actually have some charts there that were given to you because they, they're not always paid attention to, and they, they, they should be. But then we, we will go into um, an exploration of the Orthodox churches. And we're, we're going to be uh, talking about uh, some issues related to them. So that's the game plan for this morning. Some of this may bleed into next time, you know, our, our next session, and, and that's okay. That's okay. We have three hours together. Um, so to, to start off, I'll just um, mention something about my method. Um, this is not going to exactly be Ecumenism 101 in the sense that um, this is for people who have never... Um, heard of, of the term before. I know you are, you are deacons and wives of deacons and friends of deacons and, 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 and other clergy uh, present here. So I do presume you, you know some things. Uh, my biggest fear is I don't want to bore you. But I, I will say that if you, um, if you want the, the thorough background, I'll just refer to you the texts that, that you should really know well. Hopefully you have these in your library. If not, guess what? There's time. <laughs> There's time. So the, the foundational things that, that we should have. Um, what I'm going to do after I talk about these foundational things is I'm going to try to present information that perhaps you haven't heard before. Um, that, that, that will make it more engaging. So to start off with, Pope Paul VI encyclical that um, actually was released right before the conclusion of the Second Vatican Council, Ecclesium Suum. That's a very important document that really talks about the, the Catholic Church entering into this orientation of dialogue with the world, with the outside world. That, that is the primary method now of Catholics engaging with the world, dialogue, dialogue. So Ecclesium Suum offers us uh, some, some basic foundations to what dialogue is all about in a Catholic sense of it. Then from the Second Vatican Council, there are some documents that, that we should know very well. Number one, Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution on the church. The pivotal line there is the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. The Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. That might sound a little exclusive, like, well, what are we saying? That, that, that we're, we're, the, we're the best show on the road? But actually, that instead of saying the Church of Christ is, acquainted with the Catholic Church. By saying the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church, the document was saying, well, guess what? There, there are aspects, there are gifts of the Church of Christ that also exist in other Christian communities and in other uh, churches. And we recognize this and we celebrate this. So actually, this, this was an opening. Uh, the, do the document Unitatis Renten de Grazio is the document on ecumenism from the Second Vatican Council, and then Nostra Etate, which is the document on, on interreligious dialogue, and also with dialogue with the Jewish community. 
I'm sure Father Polakowski will speak to you about that quite a bit tomorrow. Um, the, the pivotal line there is the Catholic Church rejects nothing of what is true and holy in other world religions. You'll also want to know Gaudium et Spes, the, the document on, on the church in the modern world. That's an important one. Then we move on to a really important, oh, I'm sorry, a really important document for um, parish life. I'd urge you, uh, if you don't have to get, and you can get, all, all of these are available online for free, so, so you don't have to worry about even paying. The Directory for the Application of the Principles and Norms of Ecumenism. This is the one that is your practical guide. Uh, the one that, that I can give you all the advice on, well, who's to be baptized, who's not to be baptized. Uh, can we allow someone from another uh, Christian tradition to read the scriptures at Mass? All those sorts of practical things are in there. So the Directory for the Application of Principles and Norms of Ecumenism, even though it's from 1993, it's still a very helpful document and, and one that honestly, I probably look at it every single day <laughs> to answer questions that, that come to our office. Then the encyclical, the encyclical on ecumenism, Ud Udum Sint by Pope St. John Paul II from 1995. Another really important document. But those two are, are sort of older. Uh, there are two in particular that, that will give you a great updating on what's going on today. The first is The Bishop and Christian Unity in Ecumenical Vatimecum that came out in January of 2022, January of this year. Um, now, it's a document that, that is intended to instruct bishops on how to, to fulfill their obligations uh, to ecumenical engagement in their dioceses, because the bishops are to be uh, sources of unity in their diocese, not just for Catholics, but for all who, who are in their dioceses. And so you, you have this document. And when, when I was chatting with uh, Bishop Farrell, um, who is uh, the secretary of the Dicastery for Promoting Christian Unity in Rome, I was speaking with him about it, and he said, this document is meant for everybody. Um, it's not just for bishops. Everyone can benefit for it. In fact, at the, con at the conclusion of the document, you have updates on all of the international dialogues in terms of where they are today. So it's a very helpful document. And I will say that, that there is great interest uh, in this document. Uh, in, in November, we, we were able to have a, a seminar with our, our bishops uh, to, to discuss the document. It was completely optional. They didn't have to come, but a hundred of them came. A hundred came. It was very exciting for my office. Blew the budget, but it was very exciting for our office. Um, so uh, that's a great resource for you. And then, of course, Pope Francis's encyclical on human fraternity, Fratelli Tutti. So those are church documents that we'll want to know very well. Now, to flesh things out, I'll also recommend a few sources um, that, from theologians. The first, uh, Jeffrey Grow. Um, Eamon McManus and Ann Riggs. Jeffrey Grow. I just want to do a quick shout out to him. Uh, Father Bob will tell you what, what uh, not only a, a tremendous acumenist, but also a, a truly, truly holy man, uh, Brother Jeffrey Grow, and, and um, just pivotal. He was in my office for, for a very long time. Uh, it's a little bit of a dated text now, but Introduction to Ecumenism from Paulist Press. Uh, that's, a, that's a great one. But what one that recently uh, was just released a few months ago from the Catholic University of America Press, uh, just translated into English, was Philip Gouret's book, Introduction to Ecumenical Theology, which presents a Catholic view of what the ecumenical movement is about. Um, then after that, uh, another text that just was released this year, it's a little bit expensive, uh, but it's, it's really outstanding. The Oxford Handbook of Ecumenical Studies, edited by Jeffrey Wainwright and Paul McPartland. Uh, Father, actually Monsignor McPartland, is on our dialogue, our national dialogue, with the Eastern um, Orthodox Christians. And speaking of the Eastern Orthodox, the final book I'll give it a shout out to, which is published by the USCCB Publications, but we don't get royalties. 
we don't get royalties. That always goes to the publications people. Uh, the Eastern Christian Churches, a brief survey by our associate uh, director who is responsible for Eastern Christianity, Father Ron Roberson. That book is tremendous because the East, as you will see in a few moments, can be complicated. And that book uh, lays it out in, in very nice terms. So if you want a basic foundation in this work, I think uh, th these are, are the texts uh, that you'll want to look at. So you have your bibliography. I'd, since we have the computer here, I'm going to try to see if I can do this. I I'd like to show you, I'd like to give you some, some hints on something. Um, great. The website, the web works. Let's go to usccb.org, the most complex and at times annoying website in the universe. <laughs> it really is. Uh-oh. Oh, no. We may not be able to do this. Um, I guess we're not online. <laughs> Are we? Oh, let's see. Mm, there might be another way. I'm sorry. Um, but let me just talk to you about the website a little bit. Um, if you want a particular document that has come out of national dialogues uh, from the USCCB, I'm going to encourage you not to go to the search engine on the USCCB website because it's awful. <laughs> and you'll never find what you're looking for. If you have a particular document in, in mind, you know where you want to go? You want to go to Google. Just go to Google, uh, put the name of the document and USCCB, and you'll, you'll definitely find it there. Everything is posted uh, that we've worked on together through the years of our, our 23 uh, dialogues, uh, national dialogues. But it's a matter of, of, of navigating the website. But when you, when you go to, to the website, to, to, the, to the home page, you'll see uh, sort of a tab that's marked departments slash offices. You click on that one, and then you can click on ecumenical and interreligious affairs, and then you can click on documents. You can click on documents, and then you'll see the different dialogues listed, like the Oriental Orthodox, uh, the um, Orthodox, the, the Lutherans, Episcopalians, so forth and so on. And there's also a general category. Uh, fish around in there, and, and don't assume everything for a particular category is under a particular tab. You may want to fish around. Okay, we are actually working on the website right now, <laughs> but it's, it's been quite a task. So that will help you in terms of, of finding some good resources. The reason why I mention this is the texts that are on there um, were produced by uh, some pretty good scholars, scholars from the Catholic side that were commissioned by our, our bishops. Who are, who are known for being good uh, theologians, who are flexible enough to enter into dialogue, but also authentically Catholic. Um, and then theologians from the other sides who were commissioned many times by their own churches. Um, these documents would be great to use for study groups and for discussions, uh, not only in, in parishes to help people to be aware of all these wonderful things that have happened, the progress we've made with other Christians, but also perhaps even to start uh, groups uh, with, with your neighbors. To perhaps say, did, did, um, excuse me, uh, pastor of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, do you know they just released a document called Faithful Teaching, which we're still waiting for in a few months it should come out. Um, and, and it's all about the discernment of doctrine and I know that we have certain disagreements, but maybe we can, we can talk together about how we came to our conclusions. Get to know each other a bit better. You want to you wanna look at this document with me? Uh, that would be a terrific thing to do because we, we want all, all this work that, that comes from the USCCB to really come and, 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 and be with people in the pews, you know? So, that's just a little bit on resources. Let's get into ecumenical method. I'm going to be describing for you a few methods. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas said, rarely deny, seldom affirm, always 
distinguished. They, they drilled that into us in college seminary. Um, and so I'm going to once again make a little disclaimer or, or more of a clarification before we get into ecumenical methodology. A Methodist theologian, uh, William J. Abraham, was chosen to contribute to the Oxford Handbook of Ecumenical Studies, a chapter on method in ecumenism. Isn't it appropriate? A Methodist doing a chapter on method. Uh, he emphasized that ecumenism is first and foremost a work of the Holy Spirit. Sort of like what I, I was saying before. No matter what our intentions, no matter what, our, what, what methods we use, we always need to be flexible in terms of allowing there to be room for the Holy Spirit. I, I heard that that used to happen like in, in schools, right? You're, you're, you're at the school dance and, and sister comes and says, make room for the Holy Spirit, right? <laughs> well, we have to do that in ecumenism too. We have to make room for the, for the Holy Spirit. And Abraham wrote, the current challenges to ecumenism provide an incentive to become more explicit and intentional about method in the hope of making fresh progress. The dangers of self-deception and illusion are real. Ecumenism, if it is anything, is a work of the Holy Spirit who blows at will across the face of the church. Moreover, in academic work, obsession with method can readily lead to fragility and impotence. Or claims about method should be kept tentative and provisional. And such a disposition needs to be rooted in a radical openness to the working of the Holy Spirit. So as I go through these different methods, I'd encourage you in, in your own context to, to explore them, to perhaps use them when you interact with other Christians, but not consider them to be straight jackets that limit you. Rather, allow them to, to, to be a means in which you can reach out to others, which can be altered or abandoned if they obstruct uh, relationship. As I mentioned, we have 23 national dialogues that we sponsor at the USCCB. And sometimes, especially when we start off a, a, a new series, a, a new round of sessions, uh, the new theologians will come to me and say, well, how does this work exactly? Uh, what, what do the other dialogues do? And I'm generally very reserved. I don't give away too much. Why? Because all 23 have their unique qualities to them. Um, they, they really do. There are some that are very formal, and academic titles are used, and, and, and the papers are, are, are written out and organized well in advance. There are others where everyone uses the first name, and, and you get the paper and you read it on the plane, on the way to the dialogue. Um, but you know, the, the different styles work for, for different people. Some focus more on prayer, some focus more on the academy, some focus more on, on, on publishing, some focus more on public events. But the thing is, we focus in on, on what works for this particular relationship. Because this, this is another thing I, I, I want you to, to write in your notes about dialogue. Dialogue is about people. Dialogue takes place between people, not between disembodied institutions. And so there is an incarnational human dynamic to all dialogues. That's why when, when you um, look at the documents produced by these USCCB dialogues, um, they, they are very, very important to the people who wrote them. Incredibly important. Um, I, I've had the unfortunate circumstance of sometimes having to go to dialogues and seeing the bishops didn't necessarily like that. And ooh, do I get it. <laughs> do I get it. And, and I understand why I get it, because the, these documents are the result of, of these people entering into a, a, a journey together, a journey of faith, a journey in which they have prayed and they, they expose deep dimensions of, of their faith to each other. So, so every document, you know, which always lists those who participated in the dialogue after, it's, it's sort of an embodiment of these people's faith journey, their time together. So, so we remember all dialogue involves flesh and blood, human beings who have specific dispositions, interests, and even temperaments. And so each dialogue is going to, to take on a different type 
of, 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 of um, manifestation, different type of methodology, depending upon who's there. So let's talk about the, these different types of dialogues. There are three sources I'm going to use to give you these, these methods. Number one, I'm going to use the book for, uh, by Brother Jeffrey Grow, um, An Introduction to Ecumenism. Number two, uh, the theologian Susan Wood, who is on our Lutheran Dialogue, wrote an article that appeared in Theological Studies in September of 2017 on the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And then finally, the contributions of Paul Murray out of the University of, of Durham on receptive ecumenism, which is steadily growing in popularity. Now, when it comes to ecumenism, we have two goals. Goal number one, uncovering theological convergences between the different Christian communities. And as, as we do that, we can try to reach the second goal, uh, which not all Christians have, but we have uh, given our, the importance of ecclesiology to us and to our theology. The second goal, which we share with, say, the Anglican communion, we share with the Orthodox churches, the second goal is visible, concrete, structural unity. The restoration of unity between the different churches. So as we, we think about this, and as we think about methods, I'll mention there is a distinction between bilateral dialogues and multilateral dialogues. Bilateral dialogues with two uh, communities, uh, multilateral numerous communities are involved. Uh, the Catholic Church rarely engages in multilaterals. Our Protestant brothers and sisters do that more. Um, we, we, we don't do that as often because we want to pinpoint particular dogmatic issues that, that arise between us and specific communities and each Christian community has its, its, its unique set of issues that we address. But we do participate in certain organizations that in, involve numerous people at the table. One group is called CCT, Christian Churches Together which is the broadest ecumenical body here in the United States, involving, uh, we call them families. There's the Catholic family, there's the Orthodox family, there's the Pentecostal slash Evangelical family, there's the historic Protestant family, and then there's finally the historic Black Church family. Um, and, and these five families uh, try to get our, our church's leaders together for dialogue, for discussion, uh, for sometimes uh, work in terms of social justice. In a particular way, it has a deep commitment to racial justice. Um, but there are times where we have entered into multilateral dialogues, and they have been helpful on particular occasions. Uh, one would be a, a, a very recent, last January, uh, document that came out was a trilateral between the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, the World Lutheran Federation, and the World uh, Organization for the Mennonites. The Mennonites are, are the successors of the Anabaptists that believe that, that baptism should be reserved to adults, make the conscious decision. Uh, the document was on baptism, and it was very helpful because there was a document that, that was signed a while ago now, uh, the um, Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification, in which we talked about justification, but the idea of, of free will and the free will's place in justification, we sort of bracketed because we wanted to make enough latitude for us all to be comfortable in signing. Well, this multilateral dialogue, in which the Mennonites had specific insights and thoughts and questions about uh, the, the incorporation of free will in the process of, of one's sanctification and justification uh, brought something new to the table where we were, we were able to speak with each other. So sometimes those multilateral dialogues uh, can be helpful. The National Council of Churches 
uh, which the, the Catholic Church is not an official member of, but nevertheless, we, we do observe uh, what, they, what they do. Um, they, they have many multilateral dialogues with different religions. So you'll have the Christian Muslim dialogue uh, that, that they, they will work on. And, and for them, Christian is generic. It's more like pan-Protestant, you know, where, where we wouldn't necessarily fit in that table. Uh, but those are some of the multilaterals that, that are going on here in the United States. So let's talk about now these different methods of ecumenism. First, we can talk about comparative ecclesiology. This is when different churches present their views of the faith, worship life, decision-making structures, spirituality, and the like, in the hope of overcoming prejudice and stereotype. This is so important because sometimes we will use the same words and mean different things. Like what does the word sin mean? What does the word salvation mean? What does the word sanctification mean? We sometimes use the same words, but we mean different things. So when we come together, we try to iron out what those differences are. Number two, the Christological method, which focuses on what we have in common in Christ and develops um, biblical, historical, and contextual research that bring to the surface common understanding. Uh, back in, in 1952, 1952, the World Council of Churches, uh, through their Faith and Order Commission, uh, sponsored a meeting in, in, in Lund, in Sweden, in which a, a principle was articulated that's a very good ecumenical principle that we, we try to follow. The principle is anything we can do together Aside th from things that violate our conscience, we do together anything. That, that's a big goal. You know? So of course, uh, right now we aren't at the stage where, where we can share communion with many of the different churches, but we can sponsor a soup kitchen together, no problem. Can we have a scripture study together? No problem. You know, we, we understand we're coming at it from different points of view, but we can do these things. And it's interesting when you look at the academy today, something like, say, scripture study. Many times, the, the whole scripture study world is ecumenical. You have scholars from all different denominations and, and even, even members of the Jewish community who come together to engage the scriptures. And we've learned a lot from each other. The next one is contextual or intercontextual methodology. This is a methodology that acknowledges that there, there, in, in the Old, New Testament we read, there are all different types of experiences of what it is uh, to be church, of, of theology and, and liturgy. And they, they are sometimes uh, intertwined with cultural or contextual concerns. And so we, we enter into really a deep examination of what is the context? Where does this particular community find itself? Yes, please. Uh-oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's Go on down to offices and committees. There we are, offices. Committees. Ah, there we are. We have nice pictures of Pope Francis with different church leaders. We have our, our current events going on. We just released a document with our dialogue with the Calvinists. Um, but if you go to resources, you'll see documents and news releases. Go on over there. Oh, sure, absolutely. Oh, okay. We're going to make it so that everyone can see it on every screen. This is very exciting. <laughs> I don't have anything like this back home. This is quite a place. I'm really impressed. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great.
Oh, well, it, it, it's okay if it doesn't. Yeah, now. Oh, it's it's all right. Don't worry. Hopefully, can everyone see this one? We're we're gonna have to limit ourselves to this one. Oh, no worries. But now, you'll you'll see these on the top that look nice. Like you want to click on them, don't. <laughs> Click on these instead. And you'll see this disclaimer, please excuse any technical issues. But then you have general. These are, are, are your basic summary documents. Uh, they're, they're a little bit dated at this point. But then you have the documents from each of our dialogues that you can click on. And, and we've done a lot through the years, starting in, in 1965, really. So you just click on, on the, the um, flag, and you'll find everything. And then hopefully, as you click on them, they bring you right on over. Some of the documents are in PDF form. Some of them are right on the website, like this briefer one. Uh, we hope soon to have all on PDF. So that is the mystery of the USCCB website. <laughs> so let's get back into discussing methodology. So, Contextual or intercontextual methodology. We talked about the distinctions of ecclesial life that are mentioned in the New Testament. So trying to explore the ecclesial life of different communities, recognizing their context. And I'll offer you a case in point example. Here in the United States, we have a number of denominations um, that are connected specifically to the African-American community. One of the oldest from actually the late um, 18th century here in the United States, so you're talking very early, is the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And these churches sprang up, these denominations were formed, not because of, of classical reasons that we might think about in terms of maybe debates about Christology or about hierarchy or about sacraments. These denominations sprang up because of, of, of the unfortunate history of racist policies in denominations. Um, and so they, they, they went their separate ways. And as a result, the issue of racism becomes very important in terms of, of a context to engage in these communities. And we, we engage this issue of racism uh, for, for these communities, um, they understand it as a theological issue, not just a social justice issue. And indeed, uh, this is true. Because when you think about it, if we believe everyone is created in the image and likeness of God, if we believe in the word Catholic, that means universal, means for all tribes, nations, tongues, um, Racism doesn't work. <laughs> Racism is heresy. Um, so we, we look at the context of different denominations, and we allow those contexts to lead the way in, in that methodology. Uh, the next is constructive as, uh, as opposed to comparative theology. When we started out in the, in the ecumenical movement, a lot of times we look at each other's um, distinct beliefs and say, well, you believe this and we believe this. Well, this constructive approach is, well, we do know we have differences, but let's see if we can together formulate um, uh, an expression of faith on some sort of issue. Like um, not so long ago, the North American Orthodox Catholic Consultation uh, worked on a document together on the vocation of the baptized. What is the call of the baptized? And we didn't start with our differences. We started with, well, let's write this together. Let's work on this together. Let, let us construct theology uh, together from our own unique Angles. So that's constructive as opposed to comparative theology. And then the final one I'll mention, 
which has become more and more popular from uh, Paul Murray out of the University of Durham, is receptive ecumenism. And receptive ecumenism is a methodology that involves going into the conversation not as much eager to share, but more to receive. It's sort of like I think about the line from St. Francis, not to seek to be understood as to understand. You go into the conversation saying, let me see how I can find Christ and Christ's presence in this community. Um, and as that happens, as, as John Paul II mentioned in, in his encyclical in Unum Sint, we have an exchange of gifts. I am able to receive the gifts of this community and honor those gifts. And then I have the opportunity, because the other is doing the opposite of, of, of them receiving gifts from me. But I, my, my purpose is, is not to share what I have, but to receive. We are both receiving. We're both at the receiving ends of the way in which Christ is present uh, in the particular communities. So those are our different methods of entering into ecumenism. But as I said in the disclaimer, um, they're not straight jackets. Um, not so long ago, uh, we had our, our, our first session since the pandemic of our dialogue with um, a certain group, the um, Reformed churches, who are the children basically of, of, of the Calvinist movement. Um, and as we entered into the conversation, we read together an article about dialogue. Article of, it's Actually, it was a more general article about interreligious dialogue. And after uh, the article was presented and we discussed it, I was so very happy with one of the theologians who said something that was just on target. He said, there's one thing that's missing in this article that I think is important for our conversation, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. It's like, ah, yes, very good. <laughs> so, so, so behind every methodology, of ecumenical dialogue is Jesus Christ. So that we've gone through those methodologies, let's talk about the East. Let's talk about the Christian East. And we'll start off with this group, this family of churches known as the Oriental Orthodox. And you actually have these papers that have, have charts that, that will give you a sense of them. One of the things I'm going to try to do during our time together is expose you to, to traditions perhaps that, that are, are smaller and are, are not always thought of, but nevertheless are, are very important and, and should be considered. These, these churches are distinct from the churches of the Byzantine tradition, like the Russian Orthodox Church, the churches of Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, Greece, and the Middle East. All of those churches look to the patriarch of Constantinople, uh, Patriarch Bartholomew I. I got the chance to meet him. It's so exciting, like one of the highlights of my life. Um, he, he's sort of like the, the, the point of, of unity for them. He's not like the Pope, uh, but he, he, he is someone who has a certain moral authority and, and, and focus. Uh, sometimes those, those Orthodox churches are called Eastern Orthodox, and that makes up the majority of Eastern Christians, the, the Orthodox. But the Oriental Orthodox are distinct from these Byzantine churches. Uh, they're east and, and south of the old Byzantine Empire. And to tell you a little bit about them, there are, as you see from the sheet, six Oriental Orthodox churches who are all fully independent and possess many distinctive features. They don't have an individual like a patriarch of Constantinople or the Bishop of Rome as sort of the center and focus. But nevertheless, they do have a certain relationship and commonality with each other. Father Ron Roberson refers to them as a flat communion. One of the things that distinguishes them is they have an Alexandrian Christology, which is this idea of, of one incarnate nature of the word of God. They are not monophysites. They reject Eutyches and his idea of Christ's humanity absorbed into his single divine nature. But they are what we would call non-Chalcedonian. You might remember from your Christology class, the Council of Chalcedon, um, that there were some Christians who did not subscribe 
to the way in which the faith was expressed there. The, that's these individuals. So these individuals have been apart from, from, from the rest of Christendom for 1,500 years. So you're talking a very long time that, that these are, 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 are quite old and well-established communities. They're sometimes called non-Chalcedonian, pre-Chalcedonian, or even lesser ortho, uh, Eastern churches. How awful, those poor people. We don't use those terms today. Um, they only accept uh, three ecumenical councils. Uh, they, they stop at Chalcedon. Um, all of them are um, protective of their independence. Um, and all of them have experienced, sadly, great martyrdom and persecution. You might remember at one point there, there was a horrible tragedy in which some Coptic Christians uh, were, were lined up um, and, and, and were murdered uh, right on the shore of, of northern Africa. Um, that, that, that were, that those were, were um, Coptic Orthodox Christians are Oriental Orthodox Christians. And sadly, they have experienced persecution. That's something that, that brings them together. But each of them has a unique history. You can, you can look at the sheet, and you can, you can see some of them are small. The largest denomination of these is the Ethiopian Orthodox Church with 40 million. They're very interesting. Over in Washington, we have a sizable Ethiopian population. And you know, they follow a lot of the old Mosaic laws. And so I, I see them walking to church on Saturday, and they, they dress all in white because, you know, they're not going to drive, uh, and, and they, they don't eat pork. And so it, it's, it's interesting because they incorporate Jewish customs into the way they express their faith. Um, but when you get a chance, take a look at this, um, and, and you'll see that each of them, well, they have very intriguing histories. The Coptic Orthodox Church has become very popular because you remember, really, the founder of monasticism for Christianity was Anthony of Egypt. And so, so people, you can even you go to the place where Anthony was over there in Egypt. Um, we have um, very good relations with the Syrian or Syriac Orthodox Church and have, have said when it comes to them that we can share sacraments. And we have come to the point that we do recognize in all of these churches uh, valid sacraments, uh, valid apostolic succession, uh, valid priesthood, valid bishops. Um, and in, in cases of emergency with the Syrian Orthodox and some others, uh, we can exchange sacraments. This is very helpful, especially for them, because we, we have more people Sometimes they might not have access to their own priest when, say, a family member is dying, but they might be able to have access to a Catholic priest. Um, we are, there are sometimes little issues, like with the Coptic Orthodox Church, sometimes they, they insist if someone chooses to, to leave the Catholic Church and join the Coptic Orthodox to re-baptize that individual. Uh, but we're trying to iron that out and, and to say, you know, do you accept our baptism or do you not? But that's something that, that will, will continue to be worked on in the midst of dialogue. Uh, some major developments to mention. In 1973, Coptic uh, Pope Shenouda III and Paul VI, uh, they, they were able to get to the point of saying, our, our distinctions in understanding who Christ is are more a matter of language than belief. More a matter of language than belief. And they did a lot of research and analysis of historical texts. And one of the things that we discovered was that sometimes uh, people from the West uh, were writing in Greek, and the Coptics were writing in, in, in the Coptic languages, and they were mistranslating each other's texts. So they actually weren't quite understanding what the other was saying. But as a result of the dialogue, we came to see that and recognize that and say, oh, we actually, we have a lot more in common than, 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 than um, we realized. And in fact, we don't have any disagreements uh, about who, who Jesus Christ is. Uh, it's just a different way uh, of, of speaking. So that, that was a pretty big moment. And then in 1984, you have uh, Pope John Paul II and the Syriac Patriarch, Ignatius Zaka Iwas, 
who um, recognized each other's sacraments and, and spoke about communicatio in sacris, the sharing of, of, of the sacred. And we should talk about that for a moment. In certain exceptional circumstances, sacraments can be shared with some Christians of the East. Actually, pretty much with all, all Christians of the East. But they are always exceptional circumstances. Because you see, the sacraments are an inherent part of what our churches are about. They're part of our identity. And so if, if someone who is, who is, um, cop, who is a Syriac Orthodox uh, is able to receive communion in the Syriac Orthodox Church, that's where the person should go. But if there's some impossible circumstance and the person wants to receive communion and can't possibly get to a Syriac Orthodox priest, then in that case you go to, to the Catholic priest. But that's because of pastoral concern and the fact that we, 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 are, we are so close, we, we are so close in our belief that that becomes possible. But it's an exceptional thing. It's not a regular thing because we do have distinct churches. So Catholics and Syriac Orthodox may receive the sacraments of penance, Eucharist, and anointing of the sick from a corresponding minister if it is morally or materially impossible to access one of their own priests. So the latest document from our dialogue with the Oriental Orthodox uh, to, was written in, on June 21st, June 21st, uh, 2021, from the Joint International Commission for Theological Dialogue between the Catholic Church. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's June 21st, 2022. That just was released. 22. It was just released. Um, it was a document on the sacraments and the life of the church. Highlighted the importance of the sacrament for salvation, which we both agree on. Baptism as a key to the other sacraments, which is interesting because you have, say, in the Methodist church and in some Protestant communions now, there is this idea of an open table that one doesn't need to be baptized to go to the Eucharist because the Eucharist brings about healing and strengthening. But the Oriental Orthodox and we say, no, baptism, you need baptism uh, to go into the other sacraments. Um, the idea of, of, you may remember from your studies, uh, donatism, that heresy that says, well, um, the sacraments work if, if the minister is, is a, in good grace. But actually, no, the sacraments can, can work even if the minister is not in good grace. It's not a good thing not to be in grace of God, but nevertheless, that doesn't prevent the sacraments from happening. Uh, the Eucharist is the sacrament par excellence we, we agreed on, and we mutually recognize each other's sacraments. Aside from that thorny issue with the Copts I mentioned, um, we are on our way. And the guiding principle between our relationship is we do celebrate that we have an identity that is, that is very close to being in common, though not complete yet. And so we do respect our difference, but at the same time, we recognize that we need to together address pastoral needs because of the precarious situation of these difficult times, and particularly amongst the Oriental Orthodox, because there's such persecution in their home countries, they're dispersed throughout the world. And so if we can help them, you know, and we can support each other, that would be nothing but a blessing. So that's the... Oriental Orthodox. Remember them. Uh, keep this sheet in mind. Now let's move on to the bigger group uh, in the East, the, the, what we would call the Orthodox uh, churches. Um, as opposed to Oriental Orthodox, we have Orthodox. Uh, they used to be called Eastern Orthodox because it was thought that, well, the word Eastern Orthodox will distinguish them from Oriental Orthodox. But the problem is this. What does Oriental mean? Eastern, right? So Eastern and Eastern. So these days, they're, they're more just referred to uh, by, the, by the blank, by the, the simple expression, Orthodox. So the Orthodox churches, whom I mentioned to you, um, see the Patriarch of Constantinople as really the one who binds them together. So with this, we're going to just talk about uh, some preliminary background. We're going to talk about uh, the Green Patriarch which is what Bartholomew has been called because of his focus on the environment. Uh, the Orthodox contributions to the notion of understanding synodality, 
which I thought would be helpful. Maybe a few moments to talk about theological complexities related to the conflict between Russia and the Ukraine. And then finally, we need to spend a little bit of time talking about the Great and Holy Council, the Great and Holy Council of Crete. The, the pan-Orthodox world had a council, and there are important ecumenical implications to consider there. So some preliminary background. Um, number one, just to address a misconception. Uh, we all know about the schism of 1054. Have you heard that expression? You know, well, 1054, that's when the excommunications happened. That's when we had the split between East and West. Um, we, we need to actually nuance that a little bit. While it is true that in 1054, the patriarch of Constantinople, Michael Carolarius, um, and the, the See of Rome, which was represented by Cardinal um, Humbert because there actually was not a pope in, in place at the time, they did I issue mutual excommunications. But there were steps that led to that. To say, well, this was the one moment when it happened is not exactly right. There was a process that led to it. 1054 was important, but there were things before and after that contributed uh, to the division. Uh, before 1054, there were political leaders who, who used differences that weren't considered church dividing to divide for political purposes. What were some of those issues? Like a priest having a beard or not. In the East, they had beards. In the West, they didn't. When I was, um, I used to get my hair cut uh, from a, a Greek Orthodox fellow. And at one point, I did something daring. I decided to grow a beard. And I walked in, and the first thing he said was, ah, you became Orthodox. Great. <laughs> <laughs> We're a little bit more lenient on, on the facial hair in the West these days. But that was one thing. Also, uh, can the Eucharist use uh, leavened or unleavened bread? In the East, there's, there's a deep spirituality of, of the, the rising of the bread is symbolic of the rising of Christ. But for us, we have that emphasis on the Passover meal with the unleavened bread. So there's a difference of emphasis. At one point, they, they were not considered church dividing, but unfortunately, they caused division because there were political leaders that took advantage of it. I'll just say, I think that happens a lot. It happens a lot that sometimes political leaders um, pit us against each other, and really, it's a shame. It's a shame. Uh, so needless to say, there were things before 1054 that eventually led to the division. 1054 happened, but even when, when, when those excommunications happened, I think there were many Christians who probably thought, well, there's a spat. It'll be worked out. Let's see what happens. But then you know something really bad that happened? Was 1204. 1204 with the sacking of Constantinople. And, 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 the, and the Muslims came in. And unfortunately, some crusaders came in and decided to be selfish and, and, and rather um, take things and, and, and loot than to help defend. And that was seen as a great betrayal. And I think that was the final nail in the coffin of, of our relationship at that point. So, so that's one thing I'll say in, in terms of preliminary background. Number two is the issue of the filioque. You know what the filioque is? You have, in, in, in the creed, we have uh, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Well, we know originally that creed had proceeds from the Father. It didn't say it and not the Son. It just said uh, and the Father. We had some issues in the, the West with Arianism denying uh, Christ's unity uh, with the Father. And so in the West, we, we eventually added, uh, and the Son. Well, it's not present in the East. And at times, that's been emphasized as a major source of division. Well, we've had theological dialogue on that. The issue isn't as much theological. We've come to realize we just are, are, are expressing different emphases. We're, we are expressing the relationship of the Father and the Son, they are emphasizing the Father as the first person of the Blessed Trinity um, in, in the relationship. So there's just a distinction in emphasis. We wouldn't deny either of these things. But their big question is, how can you add something to a creed? How can you add something to a creed? So, so that's actually the source of division there. And, and that leads us to what is the biggest issue? Well, it's authority. In almost all of our dialogues, the issue is authority, authority, authority. You know, that, that the, the role of the Bishop of Rome, the role of, of the Bishop of Rome even to do something like to authorize an addition to a creed. 
Uh, we've made some progress, but we're continuing the discussion. And then finally, we have an issue with the sacraments. Now, this is important. According to us, the Orthodox can share in our sacraments. So it's not good to, to announce only Catholics can receive at Mass, because actually, we do have the Orthodox who can come and receive according to our tradition. Now, here's the issue. According to theirs, they can't. You know, So actually, it, it, it would cause an issue in their own community. So we do urge them uh, to respect their, their own traditions. I spoke to you about the directory for the application of principles and norms of ecumenism. Interestingly, at one point, in an earlier version of that document, it said, Catholics can go to, to Orthodox churches and satisfy their Sunday obligation, which we thought was a nice thing. You know, it, 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 expand, it extends uh, a great respect to their churches, saying, you, you can help us to fulfill our Sunday obligation. But they sort of got mad. So said, why are you doing that to us? <laughs> you know, well, why, why are you deciding? So that was taken out. That's not in there anymore. Um, so... Um, it, it would be a problem for, for them. I, I once heard a story about um, a, a couple where um, it was a Greek Orthodox uh, lady and, and a Roman Catholic fellow. They're getting married in the Catholic Church, and the fellow, uh, I, the lady decided to go and get her baptismal certificate from the Greek Orthodox Church. Now, you know that we get baptismal certificates for weddings, but when it comes to ecumenical partners, we, we can use... Uh, you know, uh, their old certificate. We don't need the new one like we get in the Catholic churches because they don't a lot of times have registers like we do. When it comes to the Orthodox, we, we never ask that. So unfortunately, she went in and said, I, I need my baptismal certificate. He asked, oh, you're getting married in the Catholic church. He, she said, yes. He went into the back, came back. Here's your decree of excommunication because you can't do that. <laughs> and over in the Greek Orthodox, get, let the priest do excommunications. Is that fun? I never got that. <laughs> but, uh, but needless to say, they, they, have, they have different rules um, in terms of these things, and we need to respect that. So that can be an issue. But I will say, there seems to be progress. There is, there is great progress when it comes to the East. Um, in November, for the first time ever in the history of the USCCB, at the meeting of bishops, we had an ecumenical delegation, a delegation from the canonical assembly of Orthodox bishops. So the Orthodox bishops came. It was wonderful. It was like the reunion of long lost brothers at this event. And when we, um, we, we had the, a session with Bishop Farrell from Rome, who was on the Skype, and during the session, Archbishop Elpido Foros, the Archbishop of, of North and South America for the Greek Orthodox, probably very, very, well, not probably, definitely very, very close to Patriarch Bartholomew, uh, got up and said, I want to pose something to you, Bishop Farrell from Rome. He said what? In the Orthodox world, we talk about the fact that now we allow Catholics and Orthodox to get married in the Orthodox Church. And we're thinking to ourselves, if we say you can receive one sacrament, how can we then say you can't receive another? So we're talking about inviting Catholics to receive communion in the Orthodox Church. What do you think about that? Now, he was like, oh, oh, oh uh, no, no comment right now, you know, because this, I think, was very new for him. <laughs> and he needed to think about things. But I was blown away, like, wow. The openness here, there is tremendous openness. Now, I'll just share with you another quick story. I had mentioned I had the great honor um, last October of meeting Patriarch Bartholomew. He came here to the United States from Constantinople. He visited us in Washington, D.C. And I went with the chairman of the bishop's committee I serve, Bishop David Talley. Is there anyone from Tennessee over here? All right, there we go. Maybe you know Bishop Talley from Memphis. Great guy. He's my boss. Uh, <laughs> so I have to say that, but he is also a great guy. Um, um, Bishop Talley and I were there. We were the only Catholics in the room. And um, Patriarch Bartholomew gave a presentation to the National Council of Churches on ecumenism. And he said some pretty amazing things. He said, the 20th century was the century of renewing relationships. The 21st century is the century of restoring communion. Woo! 
big, big. And then something else happened <laughs> that was even bigger. Um, we're, we're all there, and, and we're, we're with a number of Protestant bishops of different stripes and different religious leaders. And um, at the conclusion, they said, um, the patriarch has, has some gifts for you. And I, I got a set of cufflings, as did, a, as did a lot of other people in the room. But Bishop Talley got something different. Patrick Bar Bartholomew, first thing he did was he got up from his seat, which was shocking, and went down to Bishop Talley. And he had a box. And I was next to him, and I heard him say, this is for you, my brother. And he opened it, and it was a pectoral cross. He's the only one who got one. I didn't want to look at the Protestant bishops and say, ha ha, but. <laughs> <laughs> but needless to say, that was pretty amazing. And so, you know, we're seeing great receptivity in the Christian East um, in terms of, of our engagements. And I think there is great hope. There is great hope for the possibility of reunion. Let us pray for that. Let us pray for that. 2025 is the 700th anniversary of the Council of Nicaea. Wouldn't that be a great time to say the East-West schism has ended? Let's pray for that. Pray, pray with that. Pray with me for that. I think that'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. Let's talk about a few other things in, in regard to the Orthodox. Patriarch Bartholomew has been very involved with the care of creation. So much so that in 1997, Vice President Al Gore is the one who referred to him as the Green Patriarch. And that's a title that has stuck. In 2008, Time Magazine named him one of the top 100 most influential people in the world because of his defining environmentalism as a spiritual responsibility. You may remember that Patriarch Bartholomew, Archbishop Justin Welby of the Anglican Communion, and Pope Francis signed in September of 2001 a letter to mark the seasons of creation about the issues related to the ecological crisis. So this, this is a big commitment. In fact, if you go to the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese website, you'll see they have resources for greening the parish, for making the parish more environmentally responsible on some tangible uh, ideas. Now we might think to ourselves, well, Patriarch Bartholomew is pretty smart. He started a trend. Isn't that the in thing now to be about the environment? You hear it everywhere. We have Greta Thunberg running around, and she's the great hero that everyone loves. So Patriarch Bartholomew is in, in line with all of that. Actually, Patriarch Bartholomew and the Orthodox see this as something much deeper than a trend or a movement or, or something that is secular they actually see it as something deeply rooted in Christian spirituality and liturgy. Deeply rooted in, in, in our, our living in this world that comes from God. And they attribute the ecological crisis to a lack of proper spirituality, a lack of proper connectedness in the creator God. And they reflect, they have beautiful reflections on, on the liturgy every year um, there is an encyclical produced about the environment on September 1st. September 1st, which is uh, the day of induction, uh, the start of the ecclesial year for the Orthodox, but also now the day for, for prayer for the care of creation. But every, every year, a document is written, an encyclical about the care of creation by the patriarch. And he's, he's reflected beautifully on, on the environment and the liturgy. The idea of how can we have liturgy without the grapes to make the wine, without, without the, the wheat to make the bread, without the water that is pure and clean. And so the, this deep connection between liturgy and this world and the sacredness of this world is highlighted. I just want to mention a quick cartoon, a quick uh, advertisement. Um, the priest that you will see, I think, tomorrow Father John Polakowski, who, who is one of the premier uh, Catholic Jewish uh, relations scholars in the world, 
<laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're pretty lucky. You're, you have the rookie right now. Tomorrow you have the expert. But um, he worked with me. Uh, we worked together um, recently on a document co-sponsored by CADEO, the Catholic Association of Diocesan Ecumenical Officers, and the Catholic Climate Covenant. Uh, we worked together on a guidebook for the care of creation, which applies the principles of Laudato Si, Pope Francis's encyclical about the environment, in which he, he quotes Patriarch Bartholomew a lot in there, um, and apply it to ecumenical and interreligious contexts offers numerous conversations in which we can engage people ecumenically and interreligiously in the care for creation. So um, it's available on the USCCB website, but Google it, Guidebook for the Care of Creation, and you'll be able to find it and download it free of charge. So we can now move on to what the Orthodox have taught us about synodality. And we, we've done a lot of work. Even before Pope Francis asked us to come together in this synodal journey, uh, the, the Orthodox Catholic dialogues really led the way in terms of reflecting on synodality. Um, in 2007, the International Catholic Orthodox Dialogue produced a text, Ecclesiological and Canonical Consequences of the Sacramental Nature of the Church. Ecclesial Communion, Conciliarity, and Authority. Um, and also later on, 2016, Synodality and Primacy during the Third Millennium toward a common understanding and service to the unity of the Church. So we've done work with the Orthodox about synodality. And I know all of you in this room have been involved in synodality, haven't you, in some way or another in your dioceses. Your bishop may have called you and said, hey, help me with this. You know, you're like, synodality, what's that all about? Well, we have reflected with the Orthodox and have together come to certain conclusions about it. Let, let me give you a few. Um, the, the document, that's th that, that first one from 2007, which is sometimes referred to as the Ravenna document, because that's where it came from, Ravenna in Italy, says this. It gives something wonderful. It's a definition of synod. Because sometimes people use the word and say, what in the world does that even mean, synod? But here's the definition. The term Conciliarity or synodality, those are synonyms. Conciliarity or synodality comes from the word council or synodos in Greek, concilium in Latin, which primarily denotes a gathering of bishops exercising a particular responsibility. The bishops coming together, together responsible for the life of the church. It is also possible, however, to take the term in a more comprehensive sense, referring to all of the members of the church. The Russians uh, use a term for that, sobernost. Uh, therefore, conciliarity, also known as synodality, uh, is established. Each member of the body of Christ, by virtue of baptism, has his or her place and proper responsibility in promoting Eucharistic koinonia or communion. It reflects the Trinitarian mystery and, fi and finds therein its ultimate foundation. This is the last line in this. The three persons of the Holy Trinity are enumerated, as St. Basil the Great says, without the designation as second or third person implying any diminution or subordination. Similarly, there also exists an order among local churches, which, however, does not imply inequality in their ecclesial nature. So a synod is about the church being the church. It's not some sort of secular town hall meeting, but living the life of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the three persons, distinct yet equal. On all of us, therefore, through our baptisms, through living the life of the Blessed Trinity, being baptized in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, participate in that life together. Um, all of us together, because all of us have been given the gift of Christ in our lives. And we, we do recognize that there's a certain order in terms of the life of the church. Like, we, we would give pride of place to the Church of Rome, especially in the selling of disputes. But that does not mean Jesus Christ is more present in Rome than he is present um, here with us in, 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 in this beautiful town or in our own towns, our own areas. Christ is just as present in all of those contexts in the life of the church. So we celebrate that unity. There, there is an order, but nevertheless, there is an equality. So the Orthodox have helped us 
to reflect upon this, the importance of synodality. Moving quickly to the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. We know this is a very tragic situation. Um, and you have in these two countries uh, a majority of Orthodox Christians who sadly are now in a, a bitter conflict. There are religious dimensions to this that we need to keep in mind. Because right now, the Patriarchate of Moscow and the Patriarchate of Constantinople are really at odds with each other. Uh, first issue is, who has the authority to grant autocephaly to an Orthodox church? Who has the authority to say, you, you can be on your own, uh, with, with your own patriarch or, or head, um, and, 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 that, and be autocephalous? Who has the authority? Um, Moscow says any autocephalous church can grant that status to any of its daughter churches, while Constantinople says it alone has that authority. So but Patriarch Bartholomew said the Orthodox Church in Ukraine could be on its own apart from Patriarch Kirill in Moscow. And he said, hey, those are my people. You don't belong doing that. While Bartholomew is saying, uh, I'm the only one who gets to say that. So there is a conflict there in terms of that. Um, Moscow says Constantinople violated its canonical territory. Um, there are also issues of the fact that at one point there were Ukrainian Orthodox Christians who, who decided on their own to separate from Moscow. And they, they had ordinations and things. And all of the Orthodox said they're, 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 they're uh, sort of a, a rebel group. We don't recognize their sacraments as valid. Um, and as a result, it's interesting, when Patriarch Bartholomew said, you can be autocephalous, he all of a sudden recognized their, the validity of those orders. And Moscow was saying, hey, hold on. They weren't valid in how they are. What's going on here? So what I'm trying to say here is just this conflict does have religious dimensions to it. And there are things for us to keep in mind that, that are very complicated. The last thing I want to talk to you about before we go to the break and we're finishing up the East is the Great and Holy Council of Crete. Back in 2016, the pan-Orthodox world had a council, had a gathering of the heads of all of the churches convoked by the Patriarch of Constantinople. They went on over to Crete. And I think what you could say they tried to do was they tried to do something similar to what we did with the Second Vatican Council. They tried to look at modernity and consider how to properly address modernity. And they, they came to a, a number of documents on things like the importance of fasting, the relations of the Orthodox Church with the rest of Christianity, autonomy and the means by which it's proclaimed, the Orthodox diaspora, the sacrament of marriage, and the mission of the Orthodox Church in today's world. A lot of these things sound similar to the Second Vatican Council, don't they? Well, of course, we're going to want to think about that document on the relations of the Orthodox Church with the rest of the Christian world. Um, they, they, they go through a lot of points, God bless you, that sound very similar to the points we make in Unitatis Rent Integratio, but then they go a step further, which is really exciting to me, anyway. They talk about evaluating the successes and the failures of dialogue. So, first thing they address is there might be moments when the Orthodox churches have to withdraw from a dialogue uh, because, unfortunately, there might be issues uh, related to canonical, to quote directly, serious ecclesiological, canonical, pastoral, or ethical reasons. And the emphasis here is all the Orthodox churches have to be in agreement. Then, then, and patriarchy in Constantinople and say, uh, this relationship, it's not working. There are serious reservations. We think we need to withdraw. So that's the one side of the coin. But the more exciting one is the other, evaluating the successes of dialogue. And the document indicates that their goal, which is also our goal, by the way, is the ultimate restoration of unity and true faith and love 
There can be a differentiation of method, the method, but not aim. The aim is full restoration of unity in faith and love. And then it goes through some steps. The conclusion of any official theological dialogue, the conclusion of it, occurs with the completion of the work of the relevant joint theological commission. The chairman of the inter-orthodox commission submits a report to the ecumenical patriarch, who with the consent of the primates of the local orthodox churches, declares the conclusion of the dialogue. No dialogue is considered complete before it is proclaimed throughout the pan-orthodox world's decision. Upon the successful conclusion of the work of any theological dialogue, the pan-orthodox decision about the restoration, the restoration of ecclesial communion must, however, rest with the unanimity of all the local churches. So what have they done? They've now outlined this is what we will need to do to say we are reunited. That's big. That's big that they've gotten to this point. And we have their relations with the Oriental Orthodox, which are really, really good. And then they have their relations with us, which I'll say are really, really good. I think in particular, there are issues related to theological anthropology. Uh, what is the human person? The nature of the human person in regard to the sanctity of life, in terms of issues of human sexuality, that I think ha have really opened them up to relationship with us. To the point where it sounds like they're getting uh, pretty excited about entering into a, a reunion. You know, the document has a certain urgency to it. It actually uh, presents certain issues um, and says that these issues, they are, th this is the language. There is a need for clarification as soon as possible on ecclesiology, especially sacraments, grace, priesthood, apostolic succession. Notice that language of urgency. They want reunion. They want reunion. So there are positive signs here. And we, in our local context, need to talk about that. We need to encourage that. We need to pray for that, because spiritual ecumenism is the soul of the whole ecumenical movement. I think we're on, are, are we on break time? We're on break time. So I, I think a schedule, lunch is scheduled, right? So we'll have our, our lunch and then we will come on back. <laughs>